Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, thank you, HPCI. Thank you, Burgett, for inviting me. And thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, I've, it's an opportunity to meet many of good colleagues old, after such a long time, Dr. Bambulkar, Dr. Gita Bajaj, and so on, and making new friends. So I'm happy to talk about this topic, uh, safety of cosmetics. Uh, now, if you really think of safety, it's a bit different from the regulatory aspect, you know? We have been talking about regulations, and so you might have different regulations in different countries and regions, and that's what we have seen from Nicholas just now, how the regulations have changed. But one thing should not change, and that's the safety. A safety, a safe ingredient is safe across the globe. And so you should not have different standards. Maybe you might have different regulatory standards, but your safety standards should be unique. And that's what we are going to, I'm just going to give a glimpse of it. I know it's a very vast topic to be covered in maybe 30, 40 minutes, but let's see how I can cover it. Okay, so my presentation will go this way that a quick introduction of how it is important for safety of cosmetics because, you know, at least in India, what we have seen, it's now getting more realized that safety of cosmetics is important, you know. Um, now, when we say cosmetics, it's also a part of personal care products, so it's all, all the same, you know. And then how do you do the risk assessment? How do you, uh, you know, do your um, other, other, you know, how do you address the impurities and so on? And also, what are the challenges what we are facing today, right? So let, let me talk to Tris. So when I say personal care products, this is broad range. This, if you go in a store, you will find many of personal care products and mainly most of them you will find to be cosmetics. Now, when I say cosmetics, you will have all these different types of cosmetics, right? You have skincare products, you have got oral hygiene products, you know, your mouthwashes, you have got hair care product, you have got nail care products, you have got intimate health care products, and you have got baby care products. Now, when you talk about all these products, it's such a divergent group, you know, that it's really difficult to have one safety standard. But then you, the products might be too many products, but you have got limited number of ingredients which go into that products, you know. So addressing those ingredients becomes key. And for all the these personal care products or cosmetics, what is key is the safety of the ingredient. When you put the safety of ingredients together, you will, you know, talk about the safety of the product. Now, what makes it more challenging, you know? Now, first is how do you use the cosmetic? So for safety, when I say it from toxicology perspective or safety perspective, it is all depending on how much quantity or dose you take, right? Because toxicology or safety is a function of dose. Anything can be toxic. Some things might be, some chemicals might be toxic at low quantities. Some things might be toxic at high quantities. Even your daily salt, if you take, that's also toxic, right? You suffer from salt toxicity. If you take more salt, you suffer from hypertension and then, you know, blood pressure and, and so on. So your high amount of sugar will lead to diabetes, right? So anything can be toxic. So that's where it is a function of dose. Now, if you talk about cosmetics, right? And if I ask each one of you, how do you use cosmetics in a day? Someone is going to say, I use once in a day. Someone is going to say, twice in a day, once in a week, twice in a week. So you are taking same product, but your use is different. When your use is different, your dose is different. So how are you going to establish the safety of these products? On top of it, what are the different factors which would change? When I, when I said we need to have one safety standard, it's very easy to be said. But how do we establish that safety? Now, culture, if I say, you go to US, you go to Europe, you go to Korea, you go to Japan, you go to India, the cultural practice of using cosmetics is very different. Now, I don't want to specify anything, but in some countries, maybe they use 20 to 25 cosmetics in a day, right? applying them one set for removing them another set right so but if you go to india 
your urban india is going to use cosmetics in a different manner your rural india is going to use cosmetics in a different manner so the, your culture your country it all dictates how you're going to use these cosmetics then the use practices right somebody is going to use small quantity because you you don't specify quantities like your drugs take three tablets once three times in a day and you know five five days that's not the practice for cosmetics you don't specify anything all right so you can go up to any level you can someone if i if i say someone can use mouthwash someone will take just a you know small quantity someone is going to take it high quantity so those cultural practices are also going to be different and then individual preferences how do you, how frequently are you using right because cosmetics fragrance is there right you like the fragrance you don't like the fragrance that depends on the fre frequency of its use and then quantity you take any time just what i said just now and obviously the socio economic factor and that plays at least in india a bigger role right how much you are going to use uh, not to be little anything in some part of our countries where socio economic factors are really challenging they might take a bottle of a shampoo or this thing but once it ends they will put water and start using it right you cannot blame that but that's a practice you use right someone is going to use that way also but how are you going to establish that those standards how that's the biggest challenge what is the standard you are going to base to say okay this is the standard quantity of a shampoo or a cleanser or a, anything which can be used right so that that's a biggest challenge when we talk about it and this just gives you a clear use pattern now if you see these are different different categories i don't want you to read through all this but if you see you have some products which are used less than once in a week whereas the the other spectrum is two to three times in a day and then you see the pattern of use and that's that gives you how many products are there how many times that those can be used and what is the variation right it just gives you a glimpse of it right now when we talk of drugs and cosmetics i just want to take a few minutes that why this is important if if i ask any one of you like what is more important for you safety of drugs or safety of cosmetics and i'm sure majority of you say safety of drugs is more important to me right because they you think that you know they are drugs they might cause you harm right and that's why it, it's more important sorry yeah it's yeah right you are it's ingested but then if you talk of drug it's a controlled use right your doctor prescribes it as i said they are going to say take this tablet 500 mg now if i give you instead of 500 mg if i give you 750 mg you are going to throw it away you are not going to you are going to reject it from your pharmacist you are going to say no i i want a 500 mg tablet right if i the doctor says twice in a day you are going to take twice in a day if you are going to take it three times in a week you are going to three times in a week is someone telling you about this cosmetic right but think of it the same chemical i would repeat the same chemical can go through your drug the same chemical can go through your cosmetic right what are excipients you are using in drugs you are when i say you take crocin tablet paracetamol you look at paracetamol but how many excipients are there in this, that product you do you know that nobody knows about it the same chemical the same excipient goes in the cosmetic also now right that goes ingestible right it's ingested so you you talk about more harm but do you think if you apply it on your body it doesn't get inside the body it gets inside your body once it is inside your body it is going to cause you same harm and your cosmetic is use, use is uncontrolled use there is no control on it each one prefers has its own preferences and that's where what i feel is cosmetic safety is more you know important than drug safety there's a third aspect also food safety for food you there's no in fact you take the standard if it is okay as food then it should be okay as anything right that's the standard you use but the same chemical if it goes through your food there's totally unrest no restrictions 
right? Now, that's where your pesticide toxicity or, or your any 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 heavy metal toxicity it comes into picture at that point of time. And one fine morning, you look at the headlines and see X Y Z brand has got high heavy metals in their product, right? But you don't know your while you go on the road how much lead you inhale through your exhaust automobile exhaust. So nobody talks about it, but it's the same element, it's the same chemical which can go through your cosmetic, drug, or food, you know. So I think safety is a safety, finally, whether it goes through anything, it has to be established in a uniform manner. The next challenge, when I talk about drug, I, please don't get me wrong, I don't have anything against drugs. Huh? <laughs> because I, It might appear that I'm talking about, I come from drug industry, I've worked in drug industry, but when I came to cosmetic industry, I, I really feel that this needs more attention. Now, in a drug, again, as I said, you have got one or two chemicals or a few of excipients. In one product, in cosmetic product, how many ingredients go? These are minimum number of ingredients which are there. I don't know how many of you look into that label, you know, of any cosmetic. Minimum 20 ingredients go in, in the product, right? We in my company, initially Johnson & Johnson, now can view. We have a product in Japan, a product line in Japan, which is called as Dr. Syllabo. Can you imagine how many ingredients are there in that? On an average, I'm saying, 150 ingredients. 150 ingredients in one product. Now, can you imagine establishing, and if you recall, I said that the safety of cosmetic product is based on the safety of ingredients. That means I have to establish safety of those 150 ingredients and then only I can clear that product. I think that's more challenging, right? Although the set of ingredients might be limited, still you need to have that safety established. And so how do you do that? Okay, be before that also. There are some other aspects also which are major concern to establish the safety, right? One is what we call as, this was just one product, right? The other piece is aggregate exposure. What do you, I mean by aggregate exposure? The same, as I said, limited number of ingredients, multiple products. So if you are using five products in a day, and if you're talking of one ingredient, that same ingredient can go through five different products. You can establish the safety of one product but how are you going to establish in safety of five products? Because no one is going to use that same set. Again, like it's not consistent. One person might use four, four products, other person might use three products. And if I put together each in the ingredient coming through different products, that is called as aggregate exposure, uh, aggregate ex uh, effect, you can say. So that is definitely a gray area. One thing is to establish the safety of anything. The other piece which I've already talked is uncontrolled use. There's no control on how much to be used, how many times to be used, right? And then the other piece is when you use these cosmetics, it can be used on adults, it can be used on babies, right? Now, it, it might be very common that you like baby products, so adult can also use it, right? And it, there's no restriction and vice versa. That Maybe in few countries they might look at label, okay, this is baby product and you should only use for babies. But there are many countries which might use adult products for babies also, right? So that is, it has been established safe for adults. It might be not be used or safe for babies. The second is your normal skin versus compromised skin. Whenever you have skin like eczema or rashes, you're using the same product, right? But then the, the penetration or the exposure of that ingredient in your body increases. So that's another challenge we have, right? And then last is, you are not very much sure about the adverse events coming out of it, right? Now, there is the cosmetovigilance piece which is coming up, which is very advanced in the Europe. We are also now in India starting to look at it, but still it is in, uh, I would say, infancy. We do not have that those reports that how many are adverse effects of using a particular chemical. So those are a bit of concerns when you try to establish safety of any cosmetic. So let us 
look into how do you establish the safety of cosmetics. As I said, you need to look at each and every ingredient. So let us talk of first, what is ingredient hazard assessment? When I say ingredient hazard assessment, what is hazard? Just to be in a very layman term, it's the bio data of ingredient. What does this ingredient mean? Whether it can cause rashes, it can cause irritation, does it cause cancer, does it cause reproductive harm, does it cause anything, right? So you need to have a complete bio data or a profile of ingredient, which is called as ingredient hazard. How you use it is different. Some chemicals, if I ask any one of you in this room, can you use sulfuric acid? And everyone will say no, because you know it's corrosive. That's the inherent property of sulfuric acid. Nobody is going to use, right? If I say acetic acid, maybe few people would know, few people would not know, right? Because it's vinegar, you can use it or not. So that's fine. So in the same manner, if you have all those ingredients, you need to know about the hazard, that is, its inherent hazardous properties. Now, how many properties you are going to look at? If, if I just throw that question, what do you not want that ingredient to happen? Your ingredient should be free from what? Let us talk of cosmetic use, right? So it should be free from skin irritation. It should not cause allergy. It should not cause eye irritation, right? Or if it is a mouth, it should not cause irritation to your oral cavity. I think most of you will stop there. But if it enters your body, if it goes in your system, it can cause the same harm. So it should not cause any organ toxicity, liver toxicity, kidney toxicity. It should not cause any cancer. It should not cause any harm to your reproductive organs because it might get your uh, offsprings might or your fetus might get affected. It should not cause any damage to your genetic makeup because your future generations might get affected. So, and then if you look at these, there are at least 15 to 20 things you need to look from ingrained perspective. So what we say, local effects means the effects at the site, irritation, allergy, phototoxicity, those are your, which you can see. The systemic effects are the effects which are seen inside the body, which you cannot see. And those are which I said, you know, uh, organ toxicities and so on. Again, there are different types. What happens if you take for short duration? What you what happens if you take for a long duration? What you what happens if you take for lifelong, right? Now, cosmetics definitely you have to look at long term effects because you don't use it for a day or so. You have to use it on a continuous basis. And then, as I said, the genetic effects, the cancer effects, and re reproduction effects. One thing which has again added is, which is creating a lot of havoc is endocrine disruption, right? What does that mean? Does it cause any harm to your endocrine system? Endocrine systems are the ones which produces hormones, right? Now, if it causes any effects on your hormone producing system, your hormones will get imbalanced and then you have got series of effects, including all these effects which I have mentioned. So endocrine disruptors is a new area which, of course, it's not new now, but relatively new, I would say. That is, again, you know, it's a multiple effect which, which needs to be looked into, right? So what we do is, you have to look at literature, you have to look at reports, you look, need to look at studies which will talk about all these effects. So this, this any ingredient needs to be studied on animals. I just need to highlight this. Because you cannot test it on human beings, right? It has to be studied by animals. I'll come to this point because what are the challenges? And then if you look at the effects in animals and so on, you start having a profile of that ingredient, which I call as biodata of ingredient or hazard profile of ingredient. So that is one first thing we need to do. Once you do this, the next is, once you, you start using this ingredient, so once you start using this ingredient, you want to use this in a product now. Once you want to use this in product, you need to look at how that product is going to be used. The same ingredient can be used in a shampoo, same ingredient can be used in a sunscreen product, same ingredient can be used in a cleanser, same ingredient can go in a mouthwash, right? So how are you going to use it? 
so that what we call i'll just build this up so that we don't okay so this is how you need to look at how this ingredient would be put in the product as i said in the initial picture there are 18 to 20 ingredients in one product so we are talking of just one ingredient now now that ingredient can be going into any product so that is why we said what class of cosmetic product it is going into this and all these factors would dictate how much is the quantity of that ingredient which would enter your body how are you going to use this ingredient so the first is the class of cosmetic product the second is the quantity of product which can be used right and as i said there is a variation but to answer that to answer that variation globally there is something called as habits and use practices so there are surveys done in any country or a region how much this product is used in population that sets a average standard on how much shampoo is used how much sunscreen is used how much any other product is used so you take that as a base you know of course there is going to be variation in daily variation there but then what is the quantity of the product used in a day right the third thing is once you put that quantity on the body how much is going to enter inside the body how much is going to penetrate through your skin that that is the third factor the fourth is whether the product is a leave on or a rinse off now in cosmetic this is more common is it going to stay on the body if you are going to apply you know a lipstick it's going to stay on the body right in fact it's not going to stay only on your lips majority of can be ingested also because you know that that's the way it goes if it is a shampoo it's a rinse off you just wash it off so whether it is leave on or rinse off product right a mouthwash would be you gargle it for a couple of minutes and then throw it so it's a same leave on kind of thing so that would tell you that ingredient how much time it is going to stay on the body right i'm just talking of different factors which would dictate how much that quantity is going to enter the body right? so you might have one ingredient same ingredient can be used in different products but that different product use is going to dictate how much quantity will enter the third thing is what is the concentration of that ingredient sometimes it is used at 2% sometimes it is used at 1% sometimes it is used in 80% in the product right so that dictates how much quantity like you might have a one product 5 grams use but whether it is a 2% 5% that is going to dictate the quantity the other is frequency of application how many times you are using in a day right are you using two times in a day three times in a day once in a day once in a week or so on right and then are you using on a compromised skin or a normal skin are you using on babies are you using so what is your end population are you using on babies are you using on adult population and so on the area of use or exposure whether you are using you know intimate area whether you are using mouthwash whether so that area of exposure and whether it it is getting exposed to sun or not that is typically for phototoxicity so these are all the factors which would differentiate so same ingredient going into multiple products the product use the concentration leave on rinse off target population everything is going to say okay this is the final quantity of the ingredient which would stay on the body and finally based on that property of that ingredient how much enters into body you know because sometimes if you use i don't know how many of you uh, mostly you you will be in from chemical industry so if it's a polymer it's a large molecule it will not enter the body if it's a small molecule it is going to enter your body so that depends how much dermal or skin penetration it has and that is going to dictate how much is going to enter your body so you start with ingredient do its profile you select that ingredient put it in the product so that product use will tell you how much is going to be there for assessment then comes the stage which is called as ingredient safety assessment so you have a ingredient profile you know this is safe up to this level the entire objective of that hazard profile is you got get to know to what extent this is safe so below a particular threshold this is safe above that threshold it is toxic so that is what the hazard says the second is how you are using that product in a so ingredient in any product that's the second step the third step is based on these two combinations the threshold 
and its use, you are going to establish whether it is safe or not for that ingredient, right? Are you going beyond that threshold? Are you going below that threshold? If it is below that threshold, you're fine. If you are going above that threshold, it's toxic. Now, these all, as, as I said, they are all tested on animals. So you get a threshold based on animal studies. Now, if I ask any one of you, this particular ingredient is safe up to say, I'm just throwing it out, 100 milligrams in animals. Will you use 100 milligrams on yourself? You will say, no, this was tested on animals. We don't know what happens in human beings. So you always need to give some buffer. That buffer is called as safety margin. How much safety margin you should be using? In general, we say, in general in cosmetics, it should be 100 fold safety. So if an ingredient is safe in animals up to 100 milligrams, you say, I can use only one milligram on human body. Right? So that's the margin of safety. What we use. So you first establish a threshold, you know how much quantity is going, and then you see whether there's a 100-fold margin or not. And that's where if you have a 100-fold margin, you say, oh, that's fine. So that's what we call as, you know, margin of safety or ingredient safety assessment. And the last piece is, you know, when this same, so this is talking of one ingredient. You have got multiple ingredients going inside a formula or a product. Once it goes in the product, then you do a cumulative assessment. Whether that ingredient has got anything common in other ingredients, whether it has got any interactions with other ingredients and so on. So that is called as product assessment. If you clear each and every ingredient in the product, then only you can say, okay, your product is safe. And that's how you say from ingredient to product, you, you can then say these are all good to go for, you know, uh, final uh, launches, you know. The other one piece which we haven't talked is the impurities. Now that has got, if you look at all, you know, uh, issues which arise, they are becoming because of the impurities, right? And the most common impurity which we are talking today is of nitrosamines, right? So these are not intended. So you, when you have an ingredient, you will it will be sourced from some raw material supplier. Obviously, you have so many raw material suppliers in this exhibition today also. So if there are 10 different suppliers, they are going to manufacture the same ingredient in 10 different ways at 10 different locations. So they will have 10 different profiles of impurities. And those impurities could be heavy metals, they could be pesticides, they could be any other organic impurities and so on. So you need to do the same diligence for the impurities also because your impurities can also be unsafe, right? They, they can cause cancers, they can cause any reproductive harm. So this the way you do look at ingredients, the same way you'll have to look at impurities. And so impurities which are unintentional, but although unintentional, they are still present in your product you will have to do the same diligence, look at their hazard profile, look at how much quantity it is going, how much it is present in the, your raw material, how much raw material is getting used, and then you have to look at whether it is safe or not. So the same exercise what you're doing for ingredients will have to be done for your impurities as well. That is what we call as unintentional ingredients, right? And one more thing is, you know, what is the delivery of your product finally? whether it is powder form, whether it is uh, you know, emulsion, or whether it is spray product. And each one has got a different uh, outcome. You can put the same, same product in three different formats. Your emulsion will give a different safety profile. Your, your powder is going to be giving a safe, different profile. Your spray product is going to give you, why? Because your spray products, these can be inhaled, you know. It can go through your lungs. And that can cause a different kind of toxicity to your animal. So those all would need to be considered, right? And once you launch the product, then you look at the post-marketing data and then see whether it, whatever you launched is safe or not. And if, they are, if you have any safety concerns, definitely you'll have to address it again, right? So that's in nutshell, how do you establish the safety of cosmetics? As I said, this is a common framework. This is a common standard globally right? This has to be followed 
in a similar manner and everyone expects every regulatory also expects to be done in the same manner now in addition to this there are product specific risks which which come right and these are very common in cosmetics so i'll just touch upon them one is your sunscreen products sun care products when you talk of sun of course in india we don't have we don't use it to that extent but in many other countries sunscreen is a very common use and the most from safety perspective the most important thing is whether it is causing any phototoxicity or not because these ingredients or these products are meant to protect uv radiation right so they they will you know they are supposed to absorb uv radiation now once it does that it is prone for any phototoxicity or photoallergy so that becomes a critical thing when you are evaluating sunscreen uh, sunscreen products the second is hair dyes or color cosmetics by nature color cosmetics or hair dyes they will have heavy load of heavy metals you know so you will need to look into that and give a specific attention for those heavy metals or hair dyes for that matter they have got formaldehyde now you get formaldehyde free hair dyes but still lot of irritation lot of you know uh, safety concerns from those ingredients as i said aerosols all the spray products aerosols will have inhalation aspect to it and in that inhalation then you have to monitor what is the particle size why particle size the lower the particle size it can go through your deep lungs and cause toxicity so you need to look at that also uh and of course intimate health products because of the area delicate area they need a special attention for irritation or sensitization right the other piece is you know fragrance is flavor i know tomorrow there's there's a talk on fragrance and flavor so when you talk of fragrance you know it might be just at a very in the product it is just at 0.5% 0.2% very low score but if you look at fragrance itself the fragrance component it itself is a product because it has more than 60 50 60 ingredients in it now you of course the your fragrance house does that assessment for you but then how does it impact your product that needs to be seen similarly flavors right in your lipstick product the flavors come in picture it is synonymous to fragrance but the same because they can be ingested you need to look at the oral toxicities also for those uh, botanicals and nanoparticles again a different uh, different area which if you talk of botanicals really do not find a same set of data as you find out in chemicals so botanical extracts you might find data on root extract but you are using leaf extract in your product that's a completely different thing sometimes you get history of use of oral consumption but you are using now on skin now that that is again a different thing so how to use those botanicals how to establish safety that's a, a big challenge nanoparticles again you know how much nanoparticles are there in what format it is there that's again it nanoparticle safety is establishing safety of those nanoparticles is completely different you have only couple of nanoparticles which have been approved by sccs you know for use otherwise you need to establish and there are different norms to establish the safety of nanoparticles since last 3 4 years packaging safety again has been made mandatory in europe at least you know in eu regulations it's not there uniform uh, in globally but how do you establish packaging safety of packaging material now there again you have got different challenges whether it is primary packaging whether it is secondary packaging whether you are using a pcr whether you are using you know a virgin plastic how much is leachable how much is extracted how much can go in your product you know you need to establish that and once it goes to your product it is a same and added chemical in your product and you need to establish safety of the packaging material right and then other impurities i have already talked about how to establish that and now the latest thing is nitrosamines now the nitrosamine can cause it's it's a very different thing you have a nitro group you have a amine and then it combines and you need to know the sources from both and establish safety because these are all carcinogens right they cause cancers so this is how you need to establish safety but how do you assess the safety that's the biggest challenge right 
till now i've been saying that all your data is depending on animal study right but these these are the biggest challenges what we have one is the ban on animal studies right europe has gone ahead with ban on animal studies and this is followed by multiple regions multiple countries india has also gone ahead with ban on animal studies meaning what you cannot conduct animal studies to establish safety of cosmetic ingredients you can use the historical data before 2013 but you cannot conduct any animal studies so how are you going to establish the safety from where are you going to get those thresholds so that's the biggest challenge what we have to establish the safety and that's where your what you call as nams nams new approach methodologies or new generation risk assessment your alternative methods they have come in picture now when you say alternative method means apart from animal studies what are the different ways you can establish the safety of law? the other the most common is in vitro studies studies on cell lines studies on you know uh, bacteria and tissues and so on so you have couple of uh, you have couple of alternative methods which are being established but they need to be validated validated means will it give you the same result so today we have got validated alternative methods for few of the endpoints we have got for irritation we have got for allergy we have got for phototoxicity we have got for genotoxicity but we do not have alternative methods for major many of the endpoints like cancer reproductive harm so how are you going to establish the safety of it the most and for last two or three decades there have been efforts to generate that those alternative methods how can you replace animal studies now we have gone to an extent that we are talking on organ on chip or a body on chip so human organ is produced on a chip human body is produced on a chip and then the chemicals are exposed to that chip and then you look at the effects now so you don't use animal you don't use humans but you use those alternative methods but again the process is very slow it needs to be get validated it is going to take time but then there are efforts and i think regulators are opening up themselves for accepting those methods but that's a, still a challenge today you know couple of more challenges is emerging safety concerns if you look at only one year last one year or two years you might have found safety concerns raised on anything you know uh, just i was joking with burget uh, that if you go with those concerns after a few days you just have to swill water you know you cannot add any chemical in it that that's that's the problem so you have got issues on salicylates you have got issues on sunscreen agents you have got issues you can name any methyl salicylate anything you mentioned there's a issue if the issue of human health is not there now we have got issues on environment your few of your ingredients are causing toxicity to corals your marine species and so on. you cannot use it so from sustainability perspective although it might be good for your human health or it might not cause any human hazard but it might cause hazard to environment that also is is a problem now so when we talk of green claims yes we have to look at it but establishing those safety again ecotoxicity comes in picture that that's a big thing endocrine disruptors i have already talked about again any new data coming majority of the regulators what they say is you cannot use animal studies right for establishing safety but if the same chemical has been used in any other like drug or pesticide and if it is proven to be toxic you need to address that toxicity that safety concern that study you can consider or you need to consider that aspect that it is having some safety concern you need to address that safety concern and for that animal study is also okay for you know considering that but you cannot use it for your benefit but you have to address the safety concern so those are you know upcoming things which we need to understand or you know really address while establishing safety and again updates on regulatory requirements there are different regulatory requirements different norms last couple of months we have been talking about ethylene glycol diethylene glycol why because ethylene glycol is a contaminant in a, it's a residual in a residual solvent and because of ethylene glycol many fatalities have happened in india also right so once that happens 
everyone will talk about it and need to establish safety so every every regulator will have their focus on it and every regulator will have come up with their own thresholds you know so if you have one product you you need to look really address that and then although i've talked about animal testing majority of the countries and regions they have banned but few of the regions few of the countries they still require animal studies china they require animal studies for registration so if you are a manufacturer of a cosmetic what do you do do you conduct animal study or you don't conduct if you conduct animal study you cannot market it in a region if you don't conduct you cannot market it in china right so but china requires that so the easiest way is you do the studies submit it in china forget about that data and then you cannot use that data for launch in other products you know so that's another challenge and of course there are ethical constraints on human testing you cannot do testing on human products uh, on human beings specifically baby products how are you going to do the testing if you want to test for allergy in babies how how are you going to do that you know you cannot do that so establishing those is also a challenge so safety is i have already uh, talked about this okay i know we i'm coming to end my uh, this thing so there are couple of challenges i'll just want to wrap up we have already talked about this okay so i'll just summarize this that you know safety of cosmetic is equally important to as of drug right it's the same chemical going in the body you need to have uniform standards globally usually it is done on animal studies but now it is a ban on animal studies and you have got different challenges on establishing the safety then there are concerns on ingredients so you need to have ingredient defense and now we are talking about packaging safety and environmental safety and 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 so it will go on you it's going to be challenging but still you have to come out with safe products for safe use right that's all thank you any questions i i'd be happy yeah yeah myself vaishali uh, sir any specific lab which you can recommend for uh, toxicology studies in india there are many cro's who do, does studies okay. so if if you want to do studies the studies are not different you know whether you do it on drugs or cosmetics or pesticides the studies are same so there are multiple cro's who can do the studies you just need to do go to them and do the studies right now it depends whether you want to do a study on ingredient or you whether you want to do a study on the product itself you know so but there are multiple labs available okay so any specific recommendation from your side like uh, this uh, lab gives like a complete set of studies i won't be able to you know because that would be advertising that lab you know <laughs> because but there are multiple labs in bangalore you have what multiple labs and, and there at least there are if i know there are 43 or 44 cro's who do i can give okay. you the list you know okay yeah. but i cannot recommend one okay. you know <laughs> okay thank you sir yeah. thank you <laughs> yeah thank you very much it, yeah. i'm always impressed about the presentation thank it you. was very very good and very very helpful and i actually i i spoke also this morning and i said that um it doesn't matter where you are you have to prove the safety of your product correct and i i wanted to 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 say that we have this training which we offer as webinars so that you know because you know the the, the safety says as they are confronted with with informa information data and to in how to interpret them this is why we have started with our authorities to develop such a program which is voluntary mm. but what is also very important is that safety assessors meet safety assessors mm. you know because you know by by meeting you can exchange and this is very important as well have you ever had this ingredient did you hear about nitrosamines what about heavy metals and then you know you learn from each other mm. in within the limitations of course of compliance but i mean it's um, it's I, we think this is very important right rightly said yeah and few of the like regulations or regulators they will just copy paste it you know without looking at relevance of uh, yeah so that also needs to be looked into Thank you, Dr. Mani. 
great presentation, as Thank always. Um, one question, uh, you mentioned about ingredient interaction and safety of uh, ingredients interacting in a single formulation. Mm -hmm. Now, when, when you rightly said that today, as cosmetics are becoming popular and the consumer is using more than five or ten products, uh, then is how does a cost, like from a cosmetic vigilance point of view, how can you assess the interaction of those multiple cosmetics with each other? No, it's very difficult because people for cosmetic vigilance, they will always talk of single product, that they are use this product and they are getting these reactions, but they are not talking about multiple products being used. That's, and as I said, that's a completely gray area, you know, even aggregate exposure, how do you evaluate that? That's a gray area. If I may, we had an ingredient in Europe um, now because there is exposure from other areas as well, from food yeah. or from food supplements. And then there is always the question, is it still allowed for cosmetics? And how much is the impact from cosmetics? So we had a huge discussion on that in, in Germany and with the SCS. Mm -hmm. So that's another challenge, which is a question for a safety assessor. Right. Not many, but it is. Yeah, if you go to mouthwash, fluoride is, is one common yeah. thing, which is very commonly discussed. You get fluoride from multiple sources, food, water, everything. You might have very less amount of fluoride in your mouthwash, but you're exposed to fluoride in so many manners. Yeah? So. Thank you, sir. Uh, I have questions about uh, the China market. What you said that if you have to uh, um, open the market in the China, then uh, uh, you have to conduct the uh, animal testing. But once you conduct the animal testing, that does that mean that the rest of the world is closed for you? No, no, it is not that, you know. You conduct, so majority, majority of the time, the regulators wants it to be conducted in their labs. The studies are conducted on the product. It's not on one ingredient. And once you conduct that study, it's kind of forgotten. You don't use that data. So you need, so the animal policy is always that you will not use animal studies for your assessment. You will not conduct any animal studies for your assessment you will not use that data, right? But except if it is required by any regulatory authority for their submission. So if you use that for their regulatory submission alone and not using that data anywhere else, that should be okay. Hello? Suppose a customer gets uh, some allergy using some uh, product, then what is the way out? Can uh, he tries to get in touch through some number which is given in the you know, pamphlet or their uh, labels. Mm -hmm. What is the other way? They don't, suppose they don't reply. What is the other way to uh, go on no, with no. it? So it, these, whatever reactions you get, they are categorized as serious, non-serious kind of reactions. You know, It's mandatory on the part of companies to report any serious adverse event within 72 hours. That's mandatory. And it's obligatory to respond to you back also. If it's not serious, so adverse events might be mild to very serious, right? Usually if you get a mild thing, that goes into the data, but it's not that you would always get an answer to that mild event because there might be hundreds of, you know, phone calls coming in a day or so, customer so, care. Uh, this was about uh, using a detergent in the washing machine and a particular person got, uh, you know, rashes. So when uh, they were not using that particular detergent for washing the clothes, uh, the person was not getting. So he was telling, first though, they stopped using that detergent for that person. And uh, so what? how does one deal with this kind of yeah, thing? Yeah, so that is, you know, a personal allergy, you know, that personal hyper hypersensitivity and you can be hypersensitive anyone can be hypersensitive to anything right you just need to stop identify that and stop using that but it does not mean that particular detergent is allergic to a mass population unless it is a common effect in a population then it is considered to be a individual allergy you know? yeah uh, hello i have a question uh, with respect to the emerging field of uh, psychodermatology 
So when you have these new products which are being launched, uh, which not only uh, address you know uh, skincare, but also how do you feel good after using that product, or you know how do they help in getting better sleep? So uh, uh, what are the regulations which are going to be followed in such cases? So is it only cosmetic uh, regulations, or is it also uh, you know medical drug regulations which need to be looked at? Regulations. <laughs> 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 I think, uh, and, and I can only answer because this is a very upcoming field, it's not yet. Um, the part of the product that's cosmetic would be obviously assessed by the cosmetic authority and the regulator. But uh, the effect, if it's sensorial, I would say it still sits within the cosmetic domain. Uh, of course, I mean, they, they can claim anything that it's having. That's what was my question, that you can claim the sky, but it doesn't mean that it will change the product from, a, and because it's claiming that maybe it should not sit in the cosmetic domain. If it's claiming an effect on overall, I don't know, your neuro function or anything, then it can't sit. So your claim determines whether the product sits in cosmetic or not. Yeah. Yeah, I would, I, I, I would say the same. If you say it's you, you, on the neuro function, then it's a drug. That's it. Yeah, it depends on it depends on the claim. It's like you know, if you say anti-aging, or if you or if you say um, or it's against acne, then it's a drug. But if you say it's against the pimples, you know, it's a cosmetic. You know, so it depends really on on the case by case. And this is, by the way, something um, we always say to safety assessors. First step is look at the product and at the claims. Mm. Because don't make the work if your marketing decides to make a claim, which is not a cosmetic claim, then you have spent a lot of time for nothing. Yeah. yeah. It's claim and how to substantiate that yeah. claim. Well done. Thank you so for sharing your expertise with us. Uh, it was glad having you ha here on the dais. Uh, may I please present uh, the certificate of appreciation from Anand.